Most Christians understand the basic concept of Christianity, salvation, redemption, regeneration, sanctification, restoration, consecration, mortification, all kind of concept of Christianity. But there is another much simpler concept that they do not seem to understand. Separation. I'm not talking about married people. A very important concept indeed. It comes from God. It is a requirement established by God. And we are first exposed to this concept way back in Genesis chapter 13. The separation of the father of faith, Abraham, from his carnal, worldly nephew, Lot. Imagine the concept of separation even applies to blood family. Abraham and Lot were related, but that did not matter to God. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, in just about every book of the Bible, God reminded his people to be separated from unbelievers. In Leviticus 20, 24, God said, I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the people. And so many other places we are told to be separated. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, it is required. It is a required concept of basic Christianity. You are not to hang out with just about anybody. The danger of pollution is too great. Blood family or not, you are not to be knit together, intertwined, entangled together. You can have light fellowship with them for the purpose of witnessing to them, introducing them to Jesus, but no intimate association or business affiliation, no serious fellowship. This morning, we are going to see the mistake that was made and the price that was paid. As we continue the story of Moses, we will see that mistake that he made. We do not know exactly who made it, all the people together, all of them or just Moses, but it was a bad mistake. So please turn to our text, Exodus chapter 14. <clears throat> Remember our background, Moses is an exceptional man of faith. So far we have seen his birth, his refusal to be a rich Egyptian. We have seen his life as a shepherd. We've seen his call to the ministry. We've seen his dealing with pharaohs to let the people go. We have seen his refusal to compromise time and time again. And finally, we saw him observe the Passover and leave Egypt with over two million people. Today, we continue the life of Moses. This time, we will take his 40-year, difficult year in the wilderness. We will see the problem that resulted in hanging out with people that they were not supposed to. We will see the appointment of his replacement and his death. So verse one, now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they turn and came from Piahiro between Migdol and the sea opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of, Israel, of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. 
then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptian may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Chapter 14 is one of the most dramatic chapter in the whole Bible. First, we see the plan of God. It appears that God was leading his people into a trap. It was a trap, all right, but it was not for his people. His people were in a valley between two huge mountains. Verse 2. The Red Sea was in front of them. The Egyptians were behind them. It seems like they made a foolish mistake to go there. That's exactly how Pharaoh saw it. It was a trap, but not for the children of God. God deli deli delivered his children from the Egyptian, and he deliberately led the Egyptian into that trap. God's purpose was to bring the Egyptian after them and show them for the last time who Jehovah is. Verse 4. In verses 5 to 9, we see the plan of Pharaoh. He regretted having let Israel go. God had almost destroyed this country. How quickly we forget. He took his best 600 chariot in verse 7. A chariot was a battle weapon equivalent to a tank today. And he pursued the children of Israel in verse 8. And he overtook them by the sea in verse 9. And verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptian marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptian? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptian than that we should die in this wilderness. As long as everything was going well, the children of Israel usually behaved well. They obeyed God. They obeyed Moses. And they made progress. But if there was any little trial, any little discomfort, in their circumstances, they immediately began to complain against God and against Moses. At the drop of a, of a hat, they were ready to go back to Egypt, verse 12. And most of us at times will like them. How much disappointment, how much discomfort does it take to make us unhappy with the Lord? And we start complaining. We see in verse 11 how foolish the reasoning of unbelief is. If God wanted to kill them, he would not have bothered to set them free and move that old bunch to Egypt. He would have killed them right there in Egypt. Fear can make people do and say foolish things. They had just witnessed the mighty miracles of God in the ten plagues. They saw the hand of God. They saw the power of God. They had seen what God had done to them, and yet they still doubted. Remembering what God has done for us should increase our faith when we are in difficult situation. The problem is the people do not remember. They look at their situation and their hearts are filled with fear instead of faith. Remembering what God has done for you in the past will increase your faith. It is 
comparable to hearing the word of God. It increases our faith, we are told. When you are in a difficult situation, you need to remember what the Lord has done for you. Most people do not remember. Like the children of Israel, they look at the situation and their hearts are filled with fear instead of faith. In verses 13 to 20, we see the reaction of Moses. He was a man of faith who knew that Pharaoh's army was no threat to God. And he told the people in verse 13, fear not. Sometimes fear paralyzes us and we don't know what to do. He also told them that the Lord will fight for them in verse 14. You won't have to lift a finger in this battle. Just watch God, what he's going to do. God will fight for you. And you need to remember that the next time you are cornered by the devil. Moses was not moving. He was busy praying. So the Lord told him it was not time to pray. Yes, it is possible that it is not time to pray. It's time to move. Verse 15. There is a time to pray, and there is a time to get going and do something. Many people do not know the difference. They pray and do nothing when God wants them to move. Here God wanted Moses to get off his knee and stretch his rod over the sea and start crossing it. There is a time to pray, and there is a time to move. Many Christians do not know which is which. They pray and pray as an excuse not to do anything else. They expect God to do everything. Faith and action go together. This is the way God intends it to be. A partnership. You do your part, God will do his part. So do not sit and do nothing. God's plan for the children of Israel was to go right through the water to the other side. He told Moses to lift up his rod and to divide the water in verse 16. God will make sure the Egyptian will follow, verse 17. And they will learn that the Lord is superior to Pharaoh and all his chariots and all his horsemen. Verse 18. One more time, God will demonstrate his power and his glory in the destruction of the Egyptian army. Then the angel of God, verse 19. That is a theophany of Jesus Christ. He moved from the front of the group to the back. Why? To protect them from the charging Egyptian. He shifted from being their guide to being their guardian. Jesus is a guide and a guardian. He will guide you. He will guard you. Through the night, the pillar of cloud brought darkness on the Egyptian side. Military advance was impossible. They could not start attacking the children. That's, it takes a lo long time for two million people to cross over. So the Lord was in the back protecting them. And it gave light to the Jews on the other side. So he kept those in darkness and the children in the light. The story continues in verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on the left hand. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea 
all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass, verse 24, in the morning watch, that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptian through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptian. He took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptian said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptian. The hand of Moses over the sea did not cause the sea to go back. The Lord caused the sea to go back. Verse 21, it was not Moses, it was not the rod, it was the Lord. But the obedience of Moses by faith prompted God to move and perform the miracle. And the sea was split by a strong east wind and it dried the floor of the sea so that they would just walk on dry land. The Israelites crossed over on dry ground, we are told in verse 22. There was a huge wall of water on the right and a huge wall of water on the left. And that is scary, let me tell you. The Egyptians started to pursue them into the sea, verse 23. God said, not so fast. He troubled the army of the Egyptian, verse 24. He took off the wheels of their chariot, in verse 25. He did not want them to go and catch the children of Israel. He hindered those Egyptians. And the soldiers, the Egyptian soldiers said, let's get out of here. The Lord is fighting for them. Still Pharaoh so mad, he ignored what his soldiers said and he continued the pursuit. In verses 26 to 31, the reverse was done. When the last Israelite was on the shore, Moses again stretched his hand or the sea. God made the water come back over all the Egyptian. Verse 26. It covers the chariots, the horsemen, the entire army. Verse 28. Not one person made it. Israel saw the great work that God did for them in verse 31. Now, some people try to take the miracle aspect out of this story. And they say that the level of water was really about a foot deep. It was easy to cross. Well, if it was the case, then it was a much bigger miracle. How could God drown an entire army of Egyptians with their horses and chariot in one foot of water? And then when you look at it, it's a great miracle. Chapter 15, the first 21 verses, is the first song recorded in the Bible. It is the song that Moses wrote. In verse 20, Miriam his older sister, in her 90s, mind you, sang a joyful reply. All the women followed her, and they danced with tambourine. Miriam is the first woman in the Bible referred to as a prophetess, and she was the first woman in the Bible to play percussions. The Red Sea victory was a wonderful event, but it was not to stop Israel from continuing their journey. You must not be so taken by the success and celebration of a victory that you forget that there are more things to do, more area to conquer, more victories to win. Victory is to help you on your journey, not to hinder you. God allows us to experience some victories 
in order for us to keep going. It is to encourage us. But we cannot sit on our laurels and stop moving forward. There are people who talk about their past victories. The stuff they used to do for God many years ago. But they have not accomplished anything since then. They are satisfied with their past victories, what they used to do for God. They talk about, that's all they talk about, what they used to do for God, but they're not doing anything now. Verse 22, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara, bitter. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Then he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the disease on which I have brought on the Egyptian. For I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the water. It did not take long for the people to complain again. After the first testing, three days without water, they panicked. No more singing, no more rejoicing. God responded mercifully to the prayer of Moses. He made the water sweet and drinkable in verse 25. Now the tree that Moses tossed into the water did not have any magical power. There was nothing special about that tree. It was simply a symbolic act in anticipation of God's future work. The tree there suggests the cross of Calvary. It will transform the bitter things of life into the sweetness of life in Jesus. The tree teaches us about service. In order to do any good for others, the tree had to be sacrificed and be cast into the water. Before the tree could serve and be a blessing to others, it had to be cut down from its comfortable situation and cast into a bitter situation. And for many Christians, the idea of service is much different. They want comfort, they want convenience, they want compliments. But the requirement for service are self-denial, sacrifice, humility. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And God made quite a promise in verse 26 that you need to remember. If you diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep his statute, I will put none of the diseases on you that I have brought to the Egyptian. God has the power to keep you healthy at all time. The promise is conditional. He will heal and bless us if we obey him. Then we get to chapter 16. 
They journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The people had been in the wilderness one full month, 30 days. One month earlier, they watched the Egyptian drown into the Red Sea. It only took one lousy month for them to forget what God had done for them. Again, the people complained to Moses about the lack of food. They mourned the food of Egypt. They forgot the terrible slavery that accompanied that food in Egypt. The rest of the chapter, we see God's reaction to this murmuring. He told Moses that he will provide bread from heaven for the people in verse 4. And Moses mentioned four rules that God had concerning the manna. Number one, take only what you need. Number two, no leftovers. Number three, take double on day six. And number four, do not go on day seven. They broke every rule. God also provided quails to eat in verse 13. In chapter 17, the people again lacked water, and they almost stoned Moses. God told Moses to strike the rod, the rock with his rod, and water came out. Then Moses was involved with the first war. It was against the Amalekites. Joshua chose some men for the battle, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up the mountain. When Moses held his hand up, Israel prevailed. When Moses lowered his hand, Israel was losing. So Moses sat down. Aaron and her supported his hand, and they prevailed against the Amalekites. They won their first war. In chapter 20, Moses went up to Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God on two tablets of stone. Moses was on the mountain 40 days, 40 nights, chapter 24, verse 18. The next four chapters deals with the law, the rules of the covenant. While Moses was on the mountain, God gave him plans, blueprints for all the buildings of the tabernacle, building of the furnishing, the clothes for the priests, chapter 25 to 31. But because Moses had been gone so long, the people came to Aaron, his brother, and asked him to make us some gods in chapter 32. And the fool agreed. He collected gold, and he made a cow to worship in verse 4. God got so mad, he wanted to destroy them all, verse 10. Moses was also mad at the people, but he interceded for them. He was a good man, so God did not destroy them. Moses disciplined the people. He made the people drink the calf that he had burned, ground it to powder, and mixed with water. Moses had the worst ministry any man can ever have. In chapter 33, Moses asked to see the glory of God. 
and God said he could not see his face. So God put Moses in the crack of a rock. He covered him with his hand while he passed by. Moses was able to see the back of God, the afterglow of God. But this must have been very impressive. No man on earth has ever seen what Moses saw. Then Moses cut two new tablets and God again wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger in chapter 34. In the rest of the book of Exodus, Moses wrote about the building of the tabernacle, the making of the curtains, the board, the veil, the ark of the covenant, the table of showbread, the gold lampstand, the altar of incense, the bronze laver, even the clothes for the priest. He designed all these things. Then the tabernacle was erected in chapter 40. That's how Exodus ends. The book of Leviticus, also written by Moses, is God's guidebook for his newly delivered people. It covers a, a period of only one month. The book of Leviticus covers one month. It contains the law of acceptable approach to God. It covers the rules of all the sacrifices and the feast and the celebration. Moses also wrote the book of Numbers, and it contains two numberings, two senses of the people. Then in chapter 11, we are told that it was the mixed multitude, verse 4, who were among the Israelites that initiated and enticed all the murmuring and the complaining. Here we get the root of the problem. How could the children of Israel, the people of God, be murmuring and compla complaining all the time? What was wrong with them? Well, they were associated with carnal people. Those carnal people were bad examples to the congregation. They should never have been allowed to go with the children of Israel. When the call came, we are leaving, many people there wanted to go with them, and they were allowed to. They should not have been allowed. You do not hang out with carnal people. There will be nothing but problem. There will be a bad influence on you. Murmuring and complaining is contagious. Murmuring is one of the most contagious character disease known to men. The murmuring in Israel's camp spread quickly until the whole congregation was murmuring. Let one complainer enter a scene and soon there will be many complainers. Judas, he criticized Mary Noble's anointing of Jesus' feet. And soon many other disciples did the same. Verse 26, murmuring is inexcusable. One murmuring church member can quickly get many in the church to murmur and complain. So vaccinate yourself against this contagious disease with daily injection of the Word of God. Otherwise, you will easily be infected and become a sour complainer, a disagreeable, unhappy church member. Murmuring is a sin against God. In Numbers chapter 12, we see Miriam and Aaron, they rebel against their, their own brother, Moses, because he had married an Ethiopian woman, a black woman. First case. Nothing new under the sun. It is clear from the judgment that fell on Miriam that she was the instigator of that rebellion. The marriage of her brother triggered some resentment that was in her heart. Miriam was jealous that God had chosen only her brother as the leader, that God only spoke through him. 
she said that God had chosen her and her brother as well, and God could speak through them too. The Lord heard that in verse 2. And it says here that Moses was the most humble man who ever lived on the face of the earth. He did not say anything. He did not try to defend himself. He did not try to reason with her. He let the whole thing in the hands of God. God called the three siblings to his office, the tabernacle of meeting in verse 4. And he confirmed that Moses was the only chosen leader. He speaks with him face to face. Then suddenly Miriam became leprous, white as snow, verse 10. Moses interceded for his sister, and she was healed after spending seven nights outside the camp, in verse 15. Next week, we will take the story of Miriam. She was quite a character. Right after that, Moses sent 12 spies to investigate the promised land, chapter 13. When they returned, 10 of the 12, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, they discouraged the people from going in. They mentioned the difficulties there, the giants there, the high walls around the city. Not once did they take the power of God in consideration. The people refused to go in. I am sure the mixed multitude was behind this agreement also. In chapter 16, there was another rebellion against Moses. This time it came from a group of leaders, 250 of them, under a man named Korah. Their complaint was that Moses had exalted himself above the congregation. He was lifted up in pride. Moses fell on his face. He's always on his face. He knew this would not end well. When he called the rest of the leaders, they refused to come to meet with him. That did not bother God. The earth simply opened and swallowed them all with their households and all their goods. They're the only people who took it all with them when they died. <laughs> Would you believe that on the next day, the congregation murmured against Moses and said that he had killed the people of the Lord. God was going to kill them all with a plague. But Moses and Aaron took a censer with incense and they made atonement for the people. And the plague stopped, but 14,600 people died. In chapter 17, God was tired of all the murmuring against the leaders. He asked Moses to call all the leaders, collect their rods, write their name on their rod, and put them into the tabernacle. The rod of the man whom God has chosen will blossom. That will end all the murmuring, God said. The next day of the 12 rods, only the rod of Aaron had buds with ripe almond. And Moses said to his brother, this bud is for you. <laughs> In chapter 20, Miriam died at Kadesh and was buried there. Aaron died on Mount Hall. He was 123 years old. His son Eliezer was appointed in his place. Moses is lo losing his family now. Because there was no water, a new generation contended with Moses. That's when Moses got angry with the people. That was his sin. That was his mistake. He disobeyed God. He struck the rock twice instead of speaking to the rock as God has asked him to do. And that sin prevented him from entering the promised land. In chapter 21, the people again spoke against God and Moses. They were sick and tired of that manna. They were ungrateful for the divine providence. 
God could have let them all die or let them fend for themselves, go try to get some food. No, he provided bread every day for everyone as long as they were there. All they had to do was pick it up. Beware of ungratefulness. God has done so much for us. We need to be grateful people. This time, God sent fiery. The word fiery means poisonous serpents among the people. Many of them died. The people got scared and they came to Moses. And Moses prayed for them. And he was told by God to make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. Anyone bitten who looked at the bronze serpent would live. The lesson was faith. Those who believed God and looked at the bronze serpent by faith were healed. Those who did not believe and did not look at the serpent died. It was quite a test of faith. People were saved by faith. Way back in the wilderness, it took faith to believe that looking at that stupid brown serpent on a stick of wood would save them. But those who did lived, and those who did not died. Today, it takes faith to believe that Jesus dying on a cross, on a piece of wood, paid the price for our sin. Those who believe are saved. Those who don't are not. In chapters 22 to 24, Moses had to fight a weird enemy. Israel was getting close to the promised land. They were camped in the plains of Moab. The Moabites were the descendants of Lot. The king of Moab, Balak, hired a weird prophet, Balaam, to curse the children of Israel. Balaam tried several times from different directions. God did not allow him to curse the Jews. Moses also wrote the book of Deuteronomy. It is addressed to the new generation. Do, D-E-U, is num number two. So second generation, destined to possess the promised land. Before the transition of leadership from Moses to Joshua, there is one last interesting thing about Moses in chapter 3. Moses said, Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O oh Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand, for what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes towards the west, the north, the south, the east. Behold it, look at it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. But come in, Joshua, encourage him, strengthen him, that he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land that you will see. Moses tried several times to change the mind of God, but it is unchangeable. Then towards the end of the book, we see the transition. Moses appointed Joshua as his replacement, chapter 31. He wrote a second song in chapter 33, and Moses blessed the tribes in chapter 33. Moses did not have any special dispensation. His sin had the same consequences as the sin of the other, not going in. Millions of people, the first generation, did not go in because they had sin. 
Aaron did not go in because he had sinned. Miriam did not go in because she had sinned. God could not do Moses a special favor. He is fair for everybody. Your sin have consequences. You can beg all you want, but no change. In chapter 34, God allowed Moses to see the land. He went up to the top of Mount Pisgah, across from Jericho, and the Lord showed him the land. Then Moses died there on the mountain, and God buried him in a valley. No one knows where Moses was buried. Can you imagine the tourists today trying to visit the tomb of Moses? Moses is the only man who knew when and where he was going to die. Nobody else. All the children of Israel wept for Moses for 30 days. Joshua replaced Moses. The book ends by saying that there had never arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom God knew face to face. He was indeed the greatest servant of God. Moses' name is mentioned 850 times in the Old Testament in 787 verses. His name is found 80 times in the New Testament. He is the author of the first five books of the Bible, and he is the dominant figure in four of those books. Moses was a book writer. He was a prophet. He was a miracle worker. He was a songwriter. He was a lawgiver. He was a spiritual leader. He was one of the few men who spoke to God face to face. In the New Testament, we see Moses in Matthew 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah talking with Jesus about his coming death. Moses died, but he lives again. He was in the group that Jesus set free when he descended into Hades. That's how Moses ended up in heaven. Then Stephen preached to the council in Acts 7, and he reviewed the life of Moses as we just did here. In Hebrew 11, 24, Moses is listed there in the hall of faith as a man of faith who chose to suffer affliction with his brother rather than enjoy the pleasure of sin. It is indeed dangerous to hang out with carnal people. Israel made a big mistake by allowing a mixed multitude, carnal people, to go with them on their journey. We do not know who allowed them to go along but not one person objected and said, no, these people cannot come with us. They all agree, oh, okay, let them come. They tolerated them, and they were nothing but trouble. They were bad example, bad influence, teaching the people to yield to their craving. They caused a lot of trouble for the congregation. It is best for you to hang out with spiritual people. Avoid carnal people. How many godly kids or teenagers with great potential for God made the mistake of hanging out with their own crowd and were swept away? It is very difficult later to turn them back to God. Parents do not hang out with unbelievers. Your children will copy what you do. Make sure your kids do not hang out with unbelievers and know your kids' friends. Next week, we'll continue with the story of Miriam, Moses' sister. Had the, mis had the mixed multitude not been allowed to go with the children of Israel, the story would be totally different. People wonder, how can the children of God be so disrespectful of God and the authority established by God? 
Well, it did not start with the children of God. It started with that mixed multitude. There's those unbelievers who have no respect for God, no respect for God's authority, God appointed people. They're the one who started. It's a great insight that we have in the middle of the story of Moses that make us understand why these people were so wicked, so complainer, murmur. The story would be so different if these people had not been allowed with. They would have crossed over. In 10 days, they would be in their land. They would start fighting, and the book of Moses would be very small. But that group of people were a test, and they failed the test. Yeah, come on with us. Let's go. We're going to follow God, and it's a mistake. And people today make the same mistake. They hang out with unbelievers, and they are good Christians. There's certain things they would not do or would not say that they end up saying and end up doing because of who they hang out with. They are polluted. And it's very important that we watch ourselves and our children that they don't do that. You hang out with unbelievers, you're capable of copying what they do and what they say. So be careful. Know that one thing, that one aspect about Christianity, separation. If you learn anything today about the life of Moses, separation. Separate yourself from unbelievers. They're not good, they're dangerous, they can pollute your life and the life of your children. So may the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. Bless your life, bless your home, your family, your children, and do not allow the unequally yoke with unbelievers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.